Welcome to another installment to the Star Wars X-Wing Book Club here on John Barry 555. I'm John Barry, and today for the sixth episode, we're going to be covering chapters 11, 12, and 13. So, before we go any farther, a little housekeeping. One, for next week, we're going to be covering chapters 14, 15, and 16, and that will be on Friday as normal. I know this video is coming out on Saturday, and the main reason why is because I did not get a chance to record the video on Thursday, so I'm just doing an audio recording on Friday. So, audio recordings typically take less time for me because I can just record the audio, edit, and it's much simpler, don't have to do any fancy editing and all that stuff. So, we're just rolling with this because it's going to be easier for me to do, since I am behind, unfortunately. Um, but that's it I have for some housekeeping, so we might as well begin. And of course, since we're beginning with chapter 11, that is where we should begin, obviously. I don't know why I'm saying it like that. But anyhow, chapter 11 is a meeting with between Reg and Tilly's and... Admiral Akbar along with General Song. So basically they're talking about the unit, how it's performing. They talk about how in um, a training exercise they just devastated General Song's training squadrons of Y-Wings. And then of course they also mention how, how, um, uh, what was that going to say? Is that, um, uh, okay, this is what I was going to talk about. They talk about basically how Rogue Squadron basically has less discipline than the normal squadron, which Reg argues is a good thing because that means they're building a camaraderie, which means they can trust each other and thus perform better as a squadron. And of course he argues it's a morale thing, but then General Som pretty much um, basically counters that as hurting the morale of his trainees. So that's essentially what is going on there. And of course there's just a lot of, it's just pretty much back and forth. But what we do learn is that, um, before I get too much farther, but we do learn this, that General Som still does not have any trust of, Ta of Taiko Chochu. Still no trust. And like, and basically what amounted to a prank, he feels that um, Taiko was a part of. A prank, nothing serious, a, just a prank. Rewriting some code in order to display the unofficial rogue squadron signal on the displays of the Y rings they shoot down in the training exercise, even though they don't actually shoot them down, but that they basically take out of the training exercise. Pure prank, obviously a prank, and General Sum instantly blames Taiko Chochu. Oh, not necessarily he instantly blames Taiko Chochu, but he feels like he is somehow responsible for all of it, even though he, Reg maintained that he wasn't. Which that just shows something, it shows that basically just because uh, apparently the Rebel Alliance no longer trusts people who've been captured and escaped the Empire. I'm just saying, or at least one specific Rebel doesn't. I wonder, and why? Why is that? I actually do know why and we'll learn that later on in the series, but we, that hasn't been revealed to us yet. And then of course, Reg, it's revealed to Wedge's inner thoughts, basically on um, who he thinks is actually responsible in the squadron, who played what part, but he doesn't actually say anything. But then it's revealed that in one week, Wolf Squadron will be shipped out to active duty, and of course, Wedge is like, we need more time, and he doesn't get it. And of course, like, and he, like, tries to think of an excuse, but, like, he was, uh, in October, like, oh, this one parent needs more work, and, like, no, he's a natural. It's like, he has no good reason. And so, and, like, he just go, like, accepts it. But then he uh, then finds out that um, General Sum's Y-Wing squadron, so three training ones that Rogue Squadron essentially devastated in the training exercise, were also going to be shipped out in like a few weeks. 
like maybe two more I think it was three weeks and Red was like that dawned to him how desperate the rebellion was for new parts and getting those ships out and flying that's at least where I've taken it to be and then of course there's a you know, kind of small discussion about how eventually they're going to take Coruscant and how you no, know, is it really worth it at the time you know and basically the main thing is that um that if they don't do it some some Im- imperial warlord will so it's basically it's them or another or an imperial taking course on from an imperial but yeah and but there's this neat line from Admiral Akbar where basically um Okay, I forget um, where it was, but it was in this meeting, this conversation, where, where, where Admiral Akbar tells Jen Som and Regent Terry that, that, um, that if he wanted to hear any more arguing, he would go to another provisional council meeting, because Regent Som were arguing about something, and basically, it was um with Akbar saying like if I want argument I'll go to the provisional council which basically is a jab at politics and how the politicians are always arguing and not actually getting anything done. That is what that I think is a sort of jab at. And I feel like we can all agree on that. Let's see and then of course Co ah uh, yeah. Okay. That's where the argument was. I had it bookmarked and I didn't see it because the bookmark was covering it. So basically, um, it's, it's, it's talking about many more what led up to, to, um, Admiral Akbar making that statement. He was, um, Reg and some were basically arguing about ty- how trustworthy Tycho was again. So basically, some kind of insulted. Tycho and saying he wasn't trustworthy by saying the Bostons were more trustworthy because they got their plans. While Wedge countered that Tycho risked his life to destroy the Death Star itself. And Akbar then of course steps in and says if I want petty bickering I'll go to more council meetings. So that's where that up to that. But again I like that you know that jab at politicians just bickering about everything and not actually doing anything. So that's where that's going for there. And then of course we move on to chapter 12 at that point. Uh, and I skipped over some things but I'm talking about the... It's just established like where they're going, where Rogue Squadron is being set. Not too important at this point. And it's going to play later a bigger role in chapter 13 which we'll talk about it at that chapter. So in chapter 12 it switches back to the Imperial view, that back to the viewpoint of Critton Law and his plot such story and there's not too much they're just talking about his you know his abilities and all that but um then we get talking about Bacta again he, and so basically it sta- establishes that um Ashurin rebels on Tyseria contaminated a batch of Bacta and infected so many people rendered them allergic to Bacta. And we also learned that um, the Empire, when they discovered that contaminated batch, they distributed it on the black market to infect their enemies. It's like, that's despicable. Despicable. I can't say. That's disgusting. That's what I'm trying to say. But the other one, despicable. Can't say for some reason. But yeah, so that's talking about that. There was actually not too much I picked up on in there. Besides that Christian Law has been given the task of hunting down Rogue Squadron. And of course that and that Cohen Horn was a part of the Rogue Squadron. Which gives him even more reason be- to hunt down Rogue Squadron. And Christian Law also finally realizes that Gil, Bastra and um, Cohen Horn had a fake falling out that it wasn't real. He finally realizes that. But in chapter 13 we return back to the POV of Cohen and it's just established that it's established that he's been made lieutenant 
because of his skills. So he's com leading flight three. Wedge is leading flight one, most likely. And um, it, uh, let me make sure I got this name right. It's not stated in the chapter, but I will presume that um, well, Tiger probably wouldn't be the one leading t flight two because he's flying the shuttle. I would say, where's the name? Huh. Never mind then. Doesn't say who's leading flight two. But it wouldn't surprise me if it's Ariel Num. Uh, doesn't say that anywhere, but that's my guess. Interesting. She's not in the, the, um, the dramatis persona. She's not there. Which Kind of surprised me, to say the least. But yeah. Oh well, we'll move on from that. And um, so, he's been made to do 10 because of his skill. And he's leading flight 3. So, obviously he's at the bottom of the chain of command wise. And then, of course, we're given coordinates. And he's able, based off of the, a bunch of different co starting and ending destinations. And he has to plot... Actually, all the flight leaders technically have to plot a hyperspace route between those all those points. And Cohen Horn, using deductive reasoning, figures out the two most likely accordance he would actually need based off of what he knows about the other flights, and thus he's able to do less work and still get the right answers. Which is actually quite neat. But here is is um it's talking about hyperspace and that and gravity shadows and how that um that um if basically if a ship got too close it could spell disasters and that there's emergency cutoffs for the word I'm looking for is um emergency cutoffs so they can leave hyperspace safely. We actually see this in the canon as well. So, what this pretty much establishes, which will be important for later on in the chapter, is that gravity masses interfere with hyperspace, and ships have emergency shutoffs so that they don't. It also establishes fuel. Yeah, fuel. Ro Ro Rogue Squadron establishes that you need fuel, and that what burns up the most fuel is not type of space that burns up the least. Running up light speed burns up more fuel, but dog fighting is what really burns up fuel for on the X Wings. So, people who get mad about Solo and The Last Jedi for talking about fuel, um, yeah, fuel has always been in Star Wars. There was an entire episode of the Clone Wars, I recall, where the Republic. Defended a planet so they can secure the fuel reserves. Yeah, fuel has always been a part of Star Wars. Um, here we're talking about fuel. Don't think it, the need of fuel is important, but fuel is clearly established to exist and be necessary, and that it does get used up, and some things just burn up more fuel. Just, while well, this is Legends and Act canon, if you look in The Last Jedi, you notice that um, the Radis is not flying through hyperspace for most of it. So it's burning up a lot of fuel. Now you ask, why couldn't they jump into hyperspace? Well, some rules may have been changed, but how about this? They, when they get to their destination, they need enough fuel in order to continue to operate. I don't know, but also... This talks about how basically going to hyperspace burns up like the medium amount of fuel, for lack of a better term. Well, the thing is this. We know in The Last Jedi that they just have to maintain just enough for thrust because they're in space and they'll constantly accelerate. And the supremacy just has to keep up with them until they run out of fuel. So they don't have, they just have to accelerate at the same rate so they can just keep up. 
they would just and they probably decided to bake a few supplies so they could just outweigh the resistance. And let's be real, a mutiny could happen in that situation on the Radius, which does. I, I'm getting too far ahead on by the last Jedi, but few is established that it can be used up. And that, and the implication is that if a few is used up, it's not necessarily a good thing. But few exists. That is what's important too. If only because it's not that important in other parts of the book, but because I just wanted to say that few has always been in Star Wars, which other people have established, I'm just re-establishing it, okay? And then... Then of course they get pulled out of hyperspace by an interdictor cruiser. There comes off the payoff for talking about the mass shadows and how that affects hyperspace. And then they get into a battle of the Empire. I marked this, it's a, a little bit, you know, about them fighting, you know, the ties. But what happens in the battle is that, um, Cohen is hit by an ion cannon blast that disables his ship. And so he's unable to fight, he's in an uncontr- he's in a spin, but he's eventually- and, um, and basically he eventually is able to slow it down, but because everything is off, he's being slammed into the side of his ship. He has nothing to help keep him centered. His- in- his- his gravity compensators are shot, totally gone, so he can clearly feel where his ship is going. Remember, Red talked about earlier in the book how he liked having his compensator set to 0.5 gravity. I think it was 0.5. Maybe it was 0.05 gravity. So it can feel this, where the ship is going, but clearly he knows that you need some gravity, otherwise he won't be able to operate in space. Space because of acceleration, because Cohen is described to be essentially pinned to his ship. If you remember in The Last Jedi, when, um, when, when Poe was doing that flan thing flying, he had to sometimes, on the sharp turns, brace himself so he doesn't go slamming into the side of his X-Wing. So, you, cause he's accelerating one way, but the ship is going the other way. That's what's happening in those scenes and here. And then, of course, he's eventually able to get it to stop spinning, because he's able to, basically, because there's an manual release for the landing gear, and that, and when it manually releases, it activates an emergency circuit that would not have been affected by the ion blast because it was deactivated, which gave him enough power, basically maneuvering jets, so that he can slow his spin and stop, and thus reorient himself. While he couldn't do anything else. He was able to regain control of his craft because it was control it was spinning uncontrollably. It's also established between in the scene that he has a lucky what he considers a lucky medallion, which um I kind of forgot about that he had that. I don't remember if it was mentioned earlier in, in the book. I just want to bring that up because I don't remember I remember it from later in the books, but I don't remember if it was mentioned before. So I don't want to comment too much because I don't remember if it was mentioned before and I feel like it should have been mentioned before because it is fairly important and the way it's talked about here is as, 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 as if we've already been introduced to it. And then there comes to a point, you know, Cohen calls some help and um, Tycho is able to respond and Tycho feeds Wedge sensor data, not Wedge, Cohen sensitated so Cohen can actually shoot down some ties. And then the question is, why isn't Tycho shooting down ties himself? Why can't he? That actually is jumping a bit ahead because Cohen does not have those thoughts at this point, but he will. That's a bit of a jump ahead, but he will. But that's actually all I have for you out of those three chapters today. I'm not too much about the writing itself, except for that um, the talking about Cohen's medallion is as if it was already introduced, yet I don't remember it being introduced. So that does puzzle me. But like a lot of the stuff that's introduced in here, like it's, there's a short term payoff, like the, 
the shadow, the the gravitational masses and hazards are affecting hyperspace. That's given a short term payoff. A few chapters, a few pages later, it's paid off. Ba we're hearing a lot about Bacta in the book too, if you've noticed. Well, I think that that if you know what the other books are called, there will be a greater payoff on that. That's a longer payoff. Um, a payoff. And there's other things too. We talked about fuel in here. I don't remember if there's going to be a payoff about fuel later on in the book or in the series, but that does establish important things for just the universe in general. There's this thing in, in basically storytelling called Chekhov's Gun, which basically states that if something's introduced in a scene, it should be used la later on. So basically nothing should be frivolous. So you, so it could be anything. Let's just take the, the, the simple one, gravity masses and affects hyperspace. Well, it's introduced in that there's emergency shutoff so things, accidents don't happen. So you don't fly into a sun or a black hole or something like that. Or even a planet. In case you miscalculate or just something random happens. Now I know there have been people who've calculated and saying it's actually not, you won't, the likely chances of you hitting something are not that great. But they've also solved this is because talking about how most times um, people try to skirt systems so that in case some, their hyperdrive drive fails, they can actually be close enough where they can call for help. So there's that. Maybe a whole video on that in later on. But that is that does establish universe stuff, but also because later on in that episode they're skirting a system and they get pulled out by an interdictor cruiser that that ha is targeting some kind of ship uh, called the Black Asp, I believe it was called. But regardless of that, what that the, it is paid off. They're talking about gravitational masses and that how dangerous they can be to a hyperspace travel and that there's emergency shutoffs is paid off a few pages later with the interdictor cruiser. It's clearly set up and then it's used. Or was it, no, the black asp I think was the interdictor. So that is introduced. Now you have an interdictor cruiser introduced. Is that going to be, pay, is that just going to be a payoff of, a, pay, a payoff of an earlier invention and use the checkers gun? Or is it going to be used later on in the story? I don't know. Actually, I do know, but I'm going to let you guess on that if you ha haven't read the series before. So, so the concept of Chekhov's gun is, I think, very important in storytelling. Basically, you don't let anything go to waste. In fact, I feel like I should have been talking about this concept of Chekhov's gun with, with my review of Swan Treason. Our links are going to be in the cards for both my spoiler and spoiler-free reviews of it. So... Because everything in Swan has a payoff, clearly. But then again, when you have the smartest guy in the universe as your main character, he's going to notice everything. But yeah, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about the concept of Chekhov's gun and how things are set up for a later payoff. And of course, when you don't always do that, it does not always result in good storytelling. Um, you could look at faults in probably any media for failed thing, setups that didn't pay off. But you know what? We don't need to go that far because we're reading a book series. So something that's set up in here, will it fail? We don't know. But if it doesn't pay off in this book, in Rogue Squadron, well, it could easily pay off in Wedge's Gamble, which is book two in the series. But that's what I'm going to leave you at today. Just a reminder, next week for episode seven, we're going to be covering chapters 14, 15, and 16. So if you want to read along, please have those chapters read. And besides, I encourage you to like the video if you found yourself enjoying the video. Or dislike it if, if you rather do that. Also, subscribe to the channel if you want to stay up to date and be on uh, my latest content. And ring the bell if you want to be notified by YouTube of when I upload my newest video. 
Also, I would like to encourage you to go check me out on social media or check out uh, some options of supporting my channel. And you can just do that too, also by letting me know what you thought of my video in the comment section, what you thought of the chapters we discussed today. And of course, everything that you can want to check out about my channel, website, socials, Patreon, all that's linked in the description. So feel free to check that out if you want. And that's all I have for you today, but... All I want to say lastly is have a good day, a good night, wherever you are. May the force be with you always.